Skittles and Jelly Spoons, welcome back to Badger Works. Today, this. Uh, this is a turtle. Uh, a loggerhead turtle, I believe. Um, 3D printed by myself. Uh, my daughter wanted a turtle, and so I 3D printed one. Um, just as an aside, this is what's known as a, a print-in-place uh, print. Um, basically, it all prints as one piece, but then afterwards you break off some supports inside and it articulates. Um, so the, the fins move and whatnot. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, I'll put a link to the STL for this. Uh, it came from Thingiverse, I believe. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about airbrushing uh, and go over some airbrushing basics. One of the things I see a lot on Facebook and various other modeling groups is people, they want to get into airbrushing, but they're terrified of it. Um, you know, it is quite a scary thing to do. Um, so I thought I would share a few um, little hints and tips on how I airbrush things. This is not to say it's the right way or the only way. This is how I do it. So what we're going to do is look at how we use the airbrush uh, in some fairly basic terms and hopefully that will help people who would like to get into airbrushing but are a bit nervous about where to start. So that's what we're going to do today. So first of all I want to talk about um, airbrushes in general. Uh, I've got a few airbrushes, let me show you a couple of them. This is uh, one I got off eBay a long time ago. It's my fa first proper airbrush uh, from China. I think it cost about 15, 16 pounds, something like that. Um, comes in a set, three different sets of needles and nozzles, um, and an airbrush, an airline, everything, basically everything you need to get started. Uh, it's quite a nice little kit. I believe it's a clone of an Iwata brush, uh, but it's it's quite a nice brush. One of the nice things about it is, um, oh, well, you can see inside that cup there, but you can see right down into the needle seat. Uh, you can literally put a drop of paint in this and it will work fine. So that's one. Uh, one thing with these, it's a good idea if you get one to replace the O-rings. Um, the O-rings in them are awful. They're just basic rubber and if you put any kind of enamel or solvent based paint through them, they will just melt. Uh, so I did replace the O-rings in this. The O-rings, I bought a bag of 10 of them for a couple of quid off of eBay. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little brush to start with. I also have this which is uh, a Draper branded uh, trigger brush. Um, so this is a side feed as opposed to the gravity feed on, on the other brush. Um, and basically the way it works is when you pull the trigger, it basically puts more air and paint through um, at the same time. So there's that one. Uh, this was also a set, came with I think two different nozzle sizes, uh, 0.3 and 0.4. Uh, I tend to use 0.4 in this. I use this mainly for like large scale things like varnishes and things like that. Um, but yeah, not a bad little brush. It's a lot easier to hold and you get a, a lot more fine trigger control. Um, so it's quite nice for that. This one uh, is from Badger. It's a Sotar 2020. Uh, I bought this in one of their sales. It was quite cheap. Um, and I'm still struggling to get to grips with this one, I have to say. I don't use it very often. Um, it's quite nice in the fact that it doesn't have a needle protector on it, which means you can get in very close to things. Um, so if you want to do like fine detail and stuff like that, it's good for that. So far with this brush, I found it seems to require very, very thin paint mixes and very low pressure. Uh, but I'm still, the jury's still out on this one. I don't use it all that often. I need to spend some time and get to grips with it but it's another option and then there's this one uh, this is the brush I use for almost everything uh, it's a harder and Steenbeck evolution with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle and I use this all the time this is my go-to brush uh, I use this 99% of the time it's absolutely a cracking bit of kit it's expensive it's 120 pounds uh, but this is by far the best airbrush I've ever used um, it's gravity fed, double action, um, and it works great. So that's the one I'll be using today. Now one thing you'll notice on all of these brushes, uh, I have put uh, quick release adapters on. So basically it means that when you want to swap airbrushes, you can just put the 
uh, hose on, spray, pop it off again. Easy. Uh, you can get these in a set. Um, I think I got something like five or six nozzles and uh, two of the quick release couplings. Um, it was a few, it wasn't very expensive. It was five or six pounds, and it makes life so much easier. Um, so yeah, well worth the investment. So let's uh, look at how we actually fill the brush and mix paint. So before we put any paint in the brush, um, I just want to talk a little bit about how this works. This is, a, as I mentioned, a, a double action brush. So basically you've got the trigger here. When you push it down, air comes out. When you pull it back, you're moving the needle back and allowing paint to come out. So you can control the air pressure and you control the paint flow. So that's basically how it works. So the paint goes in here, <laughs> obviously, um, and comes out here. There's the needle. Uh, the needle goes all the way through to the front and is locked in place by that little screw. So I don't know how well you'll be able to see that, but if you look in the end there, you can see the needle coming through the end. One of the most common problems people complain about with airbrushes is, is it spitting or spluttering. Um, this can be caused by all kinds of different things. One of the things you might find, if you've got a, a brush set that comes with multiple nozzles and needles, is you might have the wrong needle in for the nozzle. <laughs> um, but usually it's because the paint's too thick, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, one other thing this uh, has, which quite a lot of brushes have nowadays, is a, a, an adjustable stop. So there's this little twist on the tail here. If I put that back on, then if I pull that all the way back, it goes right to the back. I can screw this in and it will actually, I can adjust how far the trigger will go back. Um, they're quite handy things for beginners. I don't use it, um, but... It's a handy little thing if you just want a small amount, you know, you get it exactly where you want it, you can adjust it, and then you don't have to worry about going Whoa, and spraying loads of paint everywhere. So let's put some paint in this and see how it works. So if we look at our turtle, um, I've already given this a coat of primer, which was this out of a rattle can. This is Tamiya Fine Surface Primer Light Grey. Um, I bought this because I wanted to try it, see what it was like. Uh, usually I airbrush primers on, but um, this is actually really good. I, I, I've done a couple of models with this and it's really good stuff. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, if you want to prime a lot of things, this is one way of doing it. Uh, I don't often use primer, but with this uh, 3D printed, I found that sometimes the acrylics have trouble sticking to the plastic. Um, so this primer is a good base for that. As far as the other colours go, um, I've looked at pictures of turtles, and this is not going to be 100% accurate, it's just it's for my daughter to play with, um, it just has to look vaguely like a turtle. Now, I've noticed in a lot of the pictures that these loggerhead turtles, they're basically a kind of a light brown tan colour underneath with green mottling over the top. So, for the brown, uh, I'm going to use this Tamiya XF78 wooden deck tan. That will do for that. And for the green, I'm going to use this uh, XF81 RAF dark green too. This I use this paint on everything. I love it. Uh, it's becoming a bit of a joke now that uh, everybody says I paint everything RAF colours. Well, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> uh, but this paint is is uh, it's a really nice colour, so I'm going to use that one. So what I'm going to do uh, from okay, looking at reference pictures, it looks like. Um, the turtles are basically a tan colour all over with green patches in certain areas. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to give the whole thing a coat of this um, wooden deck tan. So we'll mix some of this up in the brush and spray it on. Right, so here's our bottle of paint. I've given it a good shake. Um, now we need to get it from here into the brush. Now to do that I use these um, pipettes. These are three millimeter, three milliliter, sorry, pipettes. And basically, what you do is open the 
the paint after you've given it a good stir. Just take a little bit out. And I kind of, I mean, it depends how much you actually need for what you're going to do. I'm going to need quite a lot for this. So I basically kind of half fill the pot with paint. And then I top it off with thinners and mix it. Now, what are we going to use for thinner? I'll show you. So for thinner, I'm going to use this. This is Tamiya X20A thinner. Um, lots of people use lots of different things. Some people use isopropyl alcohol. Some people use lacquer thinners and this and that and all the rest of it. Um, I have found through bitter experience that I tend to get the best results if I use the manufacturer's own thinner. Uh, if you get the results you want with something else, that's fine. This is what I use for Tamiya paints. So what we do is we take some of this in another pipette because obviously we don't want to get paint in the thinner and put it in the pot so basically we've got a mix here of about 50 50 now we take our pipette with the paint in it and just work it in and out of the pipette, gently of course, because you don't want to spray it everywhere. And this will mix the paint and the thinner in the pot quite nicely. You can do this in a separate pot if you want, but I find if you do that you tend to waste a lot of paint. So just very gently squeeze the bulb of the pipette and it will mix it up. You might get a bubble on the top. <laughs> uh, if you do, just put a bit of rag on it and that will clean it off. Um, and that's our paint mixed and ready to go. Now, what you can do to test it is just take a, a piece of cloth, kitchen paper, whatever, and... But you'll see what I'm doing is push down to let the air through and then gently pull back on the trigger. And the further back you pull, the more paint comes out. Yeah? So you can do fine lines or you can pull back and get more coverage. So now we can start putting a coat of paint on our turtle. So same as before, we basically just pull back gently on the trigger and paint comes out. And the further back you pull it, the more paint comes out. Now you don't need to go mad with this. You don't need, you don't want runs and drips in the paint. So if you need to go over it several times, then go over it several times. It's better to do that, several light coats than one heavy coat. The other thing to remember is the paint is coming out in a straight line. So you need to move the model around, move the brush around to get coverage on all the different areas. See, it's quite straightforward. Um, I'll paint up the rest of this and then we'll go from there. Right, so here's our turtle with a couple of coats of the uh, wooden deck tan. Um, People will say, like, how often should I leave this to dry before I go on to the next coat? I mean, this is touch dry almost immediately. One of the things I do a lot is uh, I use this. Uh, this is a cheap uh, hair dryer. Um, you can sometimes pick them up in sales for a couple of quid. But basically, it's like, especially with this Tamiya paint, you can dry it in a few minutes. Just hit it with a hair dryer and it will dry up really quickly. Uh, same thing applies with like oil paints and stuff like that. Oil paints can take days to dry, or you can hit them with a hairdryer for 20 minutes and they're dry and you're ready to move on to the next step. It's entirely up to you. Um, so we're going to put this to one side for a minute and because we need to clean out the airbrush. So that's what we'll do next. So here's our airbrush. There's still a fair bit of paint left in it. Um, so what are we going to do with that? Now, I don't know what other people do. Me, personally, I pour it back into the pot. So 
So this is another reason for using like own brand thinners I've found that you never have a problem with this. Um, just pour the rest of the paint back into the pot and then we can clean out the brush. Now to clean out the brush itself, uh, what I tend to use are cotton buds and isopropyl alcohol. So I have a pipette that I keep specifically for this purpose and basically what I do is I fill the cup with uh, isopropyl alcohol and I give it a good clean out with the um, cotton bud and then spray it off uh, in a safe direction. Uh, it's a good idea if you're doing this inside to get, uh, you can get these little uh, spray cleaning pots. I've got, I'm outside in the workshop, we have an extractor system in here, um, so it's a well ventilated area, so that's how I do it. But if you're inside, uh, you really want to be using some kind of ventilation, make sure you've got the windows open, that kind of thing. You don't want to be breathing this stuff in any of it. Um, even the non-toxic stuff is still not good for you. But yeah, so some isopropyl alcohol in the pot. Um, Give it a good clean out. You might need to do it two or three times. Sometimes people will say, oh, you know, airbrushes, they take forever to clean. It takes hours to clean them and you have to soak them and buy ultrasonic cleaners. You really don't. Okay, you really don't. Um, just isopropyl alcohol in the cup, cotton bud. So, alcohol in the cup. Take a clean cotton bud. and just work it around. And then you can spray this off and it will clean out the needle and everything as well. I'm going to do this uh, towards the extractor <laughs> rather than here. So once I've done it the first time, just take a bit of tissue Give it a wipe. More alcohol. Take the clean end of the cotton bud. And just work it around. And then spray that off. And you can see that cotton bud is clean. So yeah, I mean, I've done this, it's taken me two minutes. It's not difficult. One other thing you can do is, when you've got the alcohol on the cotton bud, is just go into the nozzle and just push it in and work it around. And that'll clean the nozzle as well. And the tip of the needle. There you go, you see the paint there that's come out of there. But that brush is clean now. While we're on the subject of cotton buds and things, um, when you're done with these, uh, don't just throw them in the bin, obviously recycle them. There's enough rubbish around as it is. Uh, if you use the plastic cotton buds, um, which are, I think are preferable, what I do is I snip the cotton ends off, recycle those, and I keep the plastic tubes, because you can use those for all kinds of things, scratch building, um, making pipes and things for dioramas, all kinds of different stuff. So yeah, don't throw them away. Same goes for the pipettes as well. Um, if you really don't need them, then put them in the recycling. I have a bin, because I go through quite a lot of these, I have a, a, a bin in my workshop next to my desk um, that is specifically for these. And then when the bin is full, it goes in the recycling. So yeah, don't just throw them away. Uh, dispose of them responsibly, shall we say. Okay, so coming back to our turtle, um, the scales, um, whatever they're called on the top, uh, the shell, uh, basically these shapes are uh, green with the tan lines running through the middle. So I'm going to spray these freehand. I could mask this up. Uh, I could use some putty or something and actually go round all of these little gaps. But I'm going to show you how you can do it freehand. Um, it may not turn out perfectly, but this is all good practice. Uh, there are also blotches on the head and on the flippers. Um, so we'll take our dark green, our XF81. We'll mix this up exactly the same as before, 50-50 mix. And we'll spray it on 
and see how it comes out. So as before we take some paint in the pipette, this is obviously a clean one. We kind of fill halfway up the pot and we top it off 50-50 with our X20A thinner. And again, just work it backwards and forwards, in and out of the pipette, just gently, and that will mix the paint for you. Um, this is a good way of doing it if you're using a single colour. If you're mixing a specific colour, a custom colour, uh, you might be better off doing it in a separate vessel so that you can mix more than you need because it's quite easy to underestimate how much paint you need and then trying to rematch it again in the in the cup is difficult. Um, so yeah, if you're doing a single colour, do it like this. If you're doing a custom colour, uh, you're probably better off mixing it in a different pot. And that's it, ready to spray. Once again, we'll just do a little test on a piece of cloth. You can see you get different spray patterns depending on how close you are, for example, to the, the surface, uh, how much air you give and how much uh, you're pulling back on the trigger. So here, I'm not sure how well you can see it on the camera, but I am pulling that back probably a, a, a millimetre or so, really a tiny amount. But by moving closer, you can see I get a nice little thin pencil line. And if I move it further away, I get like a, a mist. So practice is what it takes. I'm not the greatest airbrusher in the world, not by a long shot. Uh, but I get done basically what I need to do, but it's all down to practice. Uh, nobody's born knowing how to do this. Everyone has to practice. So even if you just do what I'm doing here and just sit here with a piece of paper or a piece of like an old scrap model or something and just practice and you'll pick it up. It's really, it's not difficult, it just takes practice. So yeah, anyway, let's get on with the model. So as I said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go round the edges, not right up to the edge, just close to the edge, go around, Like that. And I'll go around the edges of all of them and then I'll come back and fill them in. See, one thing you can do, and I don't know if you've noticed how I'm doing this, but when you move from one scale to the next, if you just pull away a bit, you don't actually need to stop the flow of paint. So once you've got it exactly where you want it, you can just, uh, just hold the trigger down and just keep going. And then when you get to the end and you want to move on to the next piece, just lift up and go back in again. And to be honest, in a thing like this, a little bit of overspray won't hurt anyway, but uh, as I say, this is a good way to practice doing things like this. So when it comes down to something where you really need that fine control, you practice on something like this. See? So I'll go around the rest of these and then I'll come back and we'll fill in the fields. Now one thing you may find as you're doing this is you might get to a point where it becomes more difficult to get the paint out. And what's happening is the paint is drying on the tip of the needle. Now there's various ways you can solve this. Um, you can take a cotton bud with a bit of alcohol on it and just wipe uh, over the end. Um, what you can do is just do that. Uh, probably best to do that on a bit of cloth rather than the model but um, just give it a quick blast at full full tilt, as it were, and that will clean out the nozzle and um, get rid of any residue that's been building up in there, and then you can carry on.
Now you notice here, when I'm um, filling in these larger fields, I've pulled the brush back slightly and I'm giving it a little bit more paint just so that it covers a little bit quicker. But it still gives us the control we need that we don't go blasting it all over the place. Okay, that's the uh, the shell done. Uh, now we need to start working on uh, the flippers and the head. So you see what I'm doing here is I'm coming in and out with the brush. So instead of having to keep letting go of the trigger all the time, I can just come out, come back in, make a dot, and then come back in again. Um, one of the things that's great about practicing on something like this is this kind of mottled effect is something you see on a lot of um, uh, German World War II aircraft so this is a great way to practice that technique um, I think some Japanese aircraft had it as well Right, there's our flippers done. Now we need to do the head. Right, so that's the green done. Um, yeah, I'm quite pleased with how this has come out actually. It's, uh, I'm gonna do his eyes next. I just need to have a look at the pictures and see what their eyes actually look like, but we'll do those with a, with a normal brush. So, come along nicely. Uh, to paint his eyes, I'm going to use these um, Pro Art brushes. Uh, these were recommended to me by somebody on Facebook, and they're, I've, I've not used them a massive amount so far, but for when I have used them, they've been absolutely brilliant. So these are lovely little brushes, and they're not too expensive either. Uh, looking at the pictures, it looks like his eyes are just um, black, so <laughs> that's what we'll do. too bad. I'm just going to use a little drop of this um, Aquacolor uh, wood brown just to go round under his beak because it seems on a lot of them there it's quite heavily shaded so I'll put a little bit of this on there. What 
One of the problems with painting 3D printed models is um, you get the striations in between the layers and it's difficult to get the paint in between those layers. This is why really ideally you should sand it, fill it and so on and so forth, but uh, which I clearly haven't done with this um, because it's just a, a quick sort of toy for my daughter to play with. But uh, yeah, if you're doing stuff like this sort of in anger as it were, then um, yeah, you really want to take the time to sand and prime and fill the model properly. go well, I think it looks pretty good so what I'm gonna do now I'm, I'm gonna call this paint job pretty much done um, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give him a couple of coats of a, a matte varnish just to protect what we've already done here so for the varnish I'm gonna use this this is uh, Vallejo polyurethane matte varnish um, I like this. I, I bought some of this a long time ago, a small pot, and uh, I've got on really well with it. So this is basically my go-to matte varnish. It does actually say, um, wherever the English is, uh, that you can um, spray this through a 0.4mm nozzle without dilution. Uh, I find this stuff is quite thick and treacly, so I tend to mix it with thinner anyway. And again, as I mentioned before, I tend to stick with the manufacturer's own thinners. So I use this Vallejo airbrush thinner and um, it works really well. So let's mix it up and spray it on the model. So we'll just squeeze a little bit in. Now it is, you can see it's white in the cup, but um, when it dries, it will be clear, don't worry. Just top it up with a bit of the uh, thinner. Again, get our pipette and give it a mix. This stuff's actually quite difficult to mix to start with. Um, but it will mix if you just keep at it. This stuff tends to go a bit frothy if you over mix it, so just go careful with it. You'll get a lot of bubbles in it, but don't worry about it. So again, you can see it's quite milky in there, but it will, uh, it will dry clear. So I'll give this a good spritz all over and then we'll let it dry. So there we go, a little introduction to airbrushing for you. I hope it's been uh, useful. Um, one final point on cleaning. Uh, if you do ever need to like do a proper like really deep clean on this, which you will occasionally, uh, I use this uh, cleanup thinners. Uh, it's just cheap cellulose thinners that I buy from Wilkinson's. Um, but any brand of, of you know cellulose thinner will do. That will clean up pretty much anything. Um, and it will get the brush absolutely spotless. Uh, the only thing to be wary of this is obviously it is um, quite nasty stuff, it stinks, um, it's corrosive, it's generally unpleasant stuff so you don't want to get it on your skin, you don't want to, certainly don't want to drink it or get it in your eyes or anything like that so be very careful when you're using this kind of solvent. Um, but it will clean up anything. Uh, as I mentioned earlier be careful using this on some of the cheaper brushes because it may well destroy the o-rings. So, I mean, if it does, then you're better off replacing the O-rings with, with nitrile ones anyway, because they'll work a lot better. Uh, but anyway, there you go. That was a, a quick, very quick and dirty introduction to airbrushing. Hopefully it's uh, alleviated any concerns you may have had about it being very difficult or time-consuming or tricky or whatever. Um, as with all things, the main thing is practice. Uh, the more you practice, 
the better you'll become. Uh, it really is that simple. I mean, when I got back into the hobby after 30 years or so away, I picked up an airbrush, never used one before, um, and I've still got a lot to learn, but I can do pretty much everything I want to. So, yeah, as I say, don't be afraid of it. Uh, get yourself a, a cheap uh, airbrush, get yourself a cheap compressor, and have a go. Uh, you've really got nothing to lose by trying. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I hope this has been useful to you. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and uh, I'll see you on the next video. Thanks. Bye.